Um, welcome to the first ever Ohio Paranormal Convention. My name is James Bell. I'm the founder of Southern Ohio Paranormal Research. We're the one that's hosting this. Um, and like I said, it's the first time ever. Um, I want to give huge props to Brian Klein. He is my co-founder. He pretty much 100% put this together. Um, he was amazing. He contacted everybody. Um, everybody was able to work with us. And all of our profits, minus what the cost of Hera, goes to Ohio Historical Society. So thank you for coming out and joining us. And we have a good time. Brian, it's up to you. Up to me. Up to you. <laughs> it is up to me now. No. That's it. All right. As uh, James said, thank you for very much for coming out. Um, obviously, I'm a little nervous um, because we have 15 speakers. We have 12 vendors. Um, and I had received, you know... I had received a lot of support from the community. All of our guests here are out in support for the community. Um, and as James said as well, all of our proceeds are going to the Ohio Historical Society once we pay for our venue. We are making no money off of this event. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, Ohio's historical treasures are preserved, so it's actually going directly to the Historical Preservation Office of the Ohio Historical Society. Um, we hope to uh, have this as an annual thing here at Hare Arena as uh, long as they keep uh, inviting us. Um, so we're, uh, thanks to Hair Arena and thanks to all of our guests who will be speaking this weekend. Uh, we hope you've had a chance to meet with most of them in the, uh, the vendor area. Uh, please make sure that you uh, walk through the entire vendor area. We have guests and vendors mixed uh, together. Um, we have four rows of vendors and uh, rows against the wall. Uh, some great vendors like Patu Designs, uh, Alternative Measures, uh, Dream Airlines. We also have Theodora. Uh, we have Miss Margo, who's a bone reader. Uh, we have a Mid Angels, which does auric photos and uh, stoned and rune, re rune readings. Uh, all of our guests have tables as well, so if you want to see any books that they've, uh, that they've authored, uh, please uh, feel free to take a look at there. Ask them any questions. I'm sure they'll be glad to, uh, to uh, provide you with any information that they have. Um, before we go on, um, I do want to say that John Kachuba is going to be coming up at 1045, and after him, uh, Bill Scott... Um, both are, you know, going to be talking about something completely different. Uh, Bill Scott's going to be talking about uh, uh, haunted Kentucky spirits of the bluegrass, whereas John Kachub is going to be talking about uh, Ohio's famous haunts. Um, really looking forward to seeing both of those speakers. Um, but before we start everything, we are going to have a raffle. We have a huge amount of items that have been donated, uh, either from Shadowlands Ghost Hunter Store, uh, who uh, donated a DVR, four-channel DVR system, uh, basically, all you need to do is add a, uh, add a hard drive. But we have a uh, bunch of books. First one is More Haunted Hoosier Trails by Wanda Lou Willis. We have an autographed copy of Ghost Hunting Ohio by John Kachuba. Uh, we have two copies of True Ghost Stories from Ohio, uh, Volume 2, our friends at Dark Figure Productions. Uh, there's an autographed copy uh, of Weird Ohio by James A. Willis. We have two uh, free medium Cassano pizza uh, coupons. Uh, Casanas is a local uh, pizza place here in Dayton. They were uh, gracious enough to uh, donate two uh, free uh, coupons. We have a book on Reiki. Um, there are five uh, past issues of Fate Magazine that we're giving away. We also have five uh, Dayton Gems hockey t-shirts that we're giving away. Uh, the Dayton Gems have just recently returned to, uh, to Dayton, and they're going to be uh, playing hockey here in uh, Hare Arena, so they were gracious enough to give us uh, some t-shirts. Uh, Patu Designs gave us a uh, key ring of dichroic dicro glass. We'll be giving that away, and as I said, the DVR, uh, four-channel DVR. Um, all of them, except for the DVR, are a dollar for ticket, six, uh, six for five dollars. The DVR is uh, five dollars a ticket. So um, before everyone you know, gets up to speak, if you want to uh, put your uh, ticket in, feel free to step over to the table and we'll... Uh, Get you, uh, get you set up with that. I do also want to thank our members uh, that are helping out today. We have uh, Chris Vermillion. He's from our Columbus team. Uh, and Greg Flanagan, who is from our Dayton team. Uh, they're uh, doing an awesome job uh, just welcoming people at the door and uh, meeting everyone. So if you have any questions, just make sure you look for someone in an orange badge. We'll be happy to help you out. So with that being said, um, I'm done. <laughs> when are you going to do the raffle? Oh, um, the uh, DVR will be given away Sunday. And you have to be present to win. Uh, we want to give as many people uh, as possible a chance to uh, put in for that. The other items we'll be giving away throughout uh, today and tomorrow. Um, and they'll be just, we're going to pick one at random. 
Okay, we're going to be drawing for the uh, John Kachuba book or Weird, Weird Ohio. Um, so we're doing a lot of giveaways, so you have uh, a lot of chances to win some great items. So um, let's see what time it is. 10.30. 10.30. So yeah, we got about 15 minutes before uh, John Kachuba comes up. So if anyone would like to do uh, the raffle, feel free to uh, go over to the table and we'll get you taken care of. Yes. All right. Okay, so we'll get this uh, show on the road here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Wow. <laughs> My name is John Kachuba. Um, I live in Cincinnati. I'm a paranormal investigator and writer. And what I'm going to be doing today is talking about haunted locations in Ohio. So rather than talking about techniques and how you do things and all that, I'm simply going to give you all kind of a little bit of a road tour of some of what I consider to be Ohio's you know, nice hot spots for, uh, for ghost hunting. Um, I, I hope to talk about half an hour or so and then leave it open for some questions and all because I like people to, if they have questions, to be able to get them out and talk about that. So about a quarter after 11, um, I will shut up if I don't shut up before then. Uh, and actually, if I start running over, somebody out there with a watch can yell at me and say, hey, it's quarter after 11, shut up, and, and that will be fine. I'll be very happy to hear that. So. Um, most of what I'm going to talk to you today about uh, is are, are sites that are taken from two of my books, Ghost Hunting Ohio and Ghost Hunters. Ghost Hunting Ohio was actually my first ghost hunting book. It was written in 2004, and Ghost Hunters came out in 2007. Ghost Hunters is national in scope, but there's a little bit of Ohio in there as well, whereas obviously Ohio is completely Ohio. Um, so that's where I'm getting this information that we're talking about. And to sort of start things off, since we're in Dayton, I want to talk about some uh, local places first. Yes, I do. There, okay. Uh, Andigo the Amber Rose Restaurant. Has anybody? One person? Two people. Okay. Has anybody eaten at the Amber Rose Restaurant? Yes. Okay. Great. Great food. Good Polish food. Exactly. Good Polish food. Um, the Amber Rose has been around for a long time, and it originally started off as a, uh, a sort of general store. And it was owned by a guy named Zygmunt, and I, I'm gonna mess up, despite the fact that my name is Kachuba, I'm gonna mess up his last name. But it's like, it's like Skopolowski, <laughs> roughly. It's spelled that way. Um, Zygmunt had a general store, and they used to live up top, which was typical in days like that, and the store was down below. He had a daughter they nicknamed Chicky, and she was the youngest of his children. Chicky never married. She stayed home, she tended to the family business, and in fact, she lived upstairs by herself after the family passed away. She was the last one there, and she lived upstairs and, and passed away at that home at a, at a ripe old age. Uh, it is now a restaurant, and the restaurant has used the bottom level as its serving area, but they've also gone upstairs. So a chicken's former bedroom is now a, a small dining room as well. So you can imagine you're eating a chicken's bedroom. Uh, the downstairs is very interesting. They still have some of the old appliances and counters from the general store. They've got this huge scale that they used to weigh, I don't know what, I don't know, <laughs> bags of stuff, barrels of stuff, I don't know. And uh, the Skop Skopolowski name is engraved on this scale. You can still go there and weigh yourself if you want before the meal and after the meal. You know, it's kind of a nice gimmick. But um, the people that work at the restaurant say that, that Chicky, who lived there basically her whole life, is still there. And I talked to a lot of the wait staff there and the servers, and they had a great Eastern European meal there. If you like German, Russian, whatever, this is the place to go. Uh, there's a lot of things that happened. One of the servers said that she had gone down to the basement, which is basically their storeroom. And, you know, for institutional use, mayonnaise and salad dressings come in like 85 gallon drums, you know. And they put them on shelves. And she said she was downstairs. And these were lined up on a shelf, and that one fell off. And I said, so big deal, one fell off. I mean, that's what's so odd about that. If you have it unbalanced or something, it's going to happen. She said, well, I don't mean fell off as much as floated off and then flew to the floor, which is a little bit different than falling off. So that kind of upset her a little bit to think that something like that was going on. Her husband also works in the restaurant. He was a chef. He said one night he was working in the kitchen, and I, they have a small kitchen upstairs and a main one downstairs. He was working in the upstairs kitchen, and he noticed 
out of the corner of his eye, he saw kind of a glow, and he turned, and he said he saw basically a ball of blue light just floating in the air about 10 feet away from him. And he just, and it just disappeared. He had no idea what it was. But there were no windows uh, that could have had like any kind of reflection. There wasn't any, you can see where this place is. It's, it's in a residential area. So there's like no neon lights outside or anything else like that that would have made some kind of a blue image. It was just this blue ball of light. He said it was kind of a glowing, flashing ball and it disappeared. So you've had those kinds of things going on there. Um, and, and you know, things get moved around all the time. They'll set up a, a table with place settings for a, a party that's being reserved or something like that. They'll turn around five minutes later and everything is moved around. You know, the typical things that you hear in restaurants. Restaurant ghosts love to mess around with place settings. I don't know why you do. Uh, but it's a very interesting place. And the nice thing about it is, unlike so many hauntings where people are afraid, you know, of what's going on, the people at the Amber Rose, the wait staff, they love it. They say, you know, Chicky is here. She loves this place. She was here in life. She's still here. She's watching out for us. Yeah, she's a prankster. Yeah, she's a little bit of pain in the butt. You know, this is Chicky's house and we respect that. So I, I kind of like that attitude. But that's Dayton. That's nearby. Um, Woodlawn Cemetery. Has anyone been out to Woodlawn? Okay, Woodlawn? Oh, so it's not Lawn, it's L A N D? Yeah. Ah. This is a different place. This is just different. Okay. <laughs> Woodland Cemetery. <laughs> lawn, land, I mean, come on. Uh, this is a very interesting place, very historic. The Wright brothers are buried there. Uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, the famous African American poet, is buried there. Uh, Irma Bombeck, you know, the humorist, is buried there. The interesting thing about Irma Bombeck's stone is that it's, it's literally a stone. It's a big rock, and there's no inscription on it, no name, nothing. It's just this rock. And if you don't know it's Irma Bombeck's grave, you know, you wouldn't know it's Irma Bombeck's grave. <laughs> it's a big rock. Uh, but this is probably the most interesting monument in there, and it's the grave of a boy named Johnny Morehouse. And back in the day, back in the mid-19th century, as you probably know, Dayton, Cincinnati, a lot of major cities in Ohio were canal towns. You know, there was literally thousands of miles of canals all across Ohio. That's how commerce um, you know, went from one place to another. Dayton was a big place, big canal city. Uh, Johnny Morehouse in 1860 was a five-year-old boy who was playing by one of the canals, and he fell into the canal. He was with his dog. Johnny was five years old, couldn't swim. He fell into the canal. And the story is that his faithful dog jumped in immediately after him to try whether, you know, whether the dog was trying to rescue him or just following his master, I don't know. But in any case, both the boy and the dog drowned. Kind of a tragic story. But Johnny Morehouse was buried in Woodland Cemetery. Uh, and this is his monument. And you know, it's hard to make it out, but the dog actually has his paw, his leg, and his paw over the form of the boy as if he's like really protecting him. And people go to the cemetery and they give little presents to Johnny. You know, uh, he's actually, it's hard to tell on this thing, but he's actually wearing a knit cap, the boy. You see his head is right here. And this is not stone. Somebody put a knit cap over him to keep him warm, <laughs> I guess, at night, you know. Um, this, this photo I took around Easter. So you notice people brought little Easter baskets and bunnies. And the reason why they do that, because people say that Johnny is still there, that they have seen the vision of a little boy and a dog sort of walking around at night there. So people believe that Johnny Morehouse is still there. In addition to that, there's been sightings of uh, a woman in, well, actually not in white. It's, it's very odd because she appears in sort of modern contemporary dress. She's been seen several times in the same place at a particular gravestone crying. She's, she's literally sitting near it and she's weeping. And she's a young girl, she's in her 20s. She's wearing, the description said she's wearing jeans, like a red top and a blue sweater like, you know, tied around the waist. So it's a very specific description. And people that have seen her, and some people have, keep saying that they have that same description of her. And they always see her in sort of the same position, the same stone, weeping all the time. So nobody knows exactly yet who that is. And, and as far as I know, no investigators have put any kind of history together on that. But it seems modern. It seems contemporary. You know, jeans and a sweater wrapped around your waist. That's a very sort of contemporary style. So there's a couple of things happening here at, um, at Woodland.
Uh, one of my favorite places in Dayton is the United States Air Force Museum up at Wright Pat at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, if you haven't been there, it's just a great museum to go to, just to see all the aircraft. And, you know, this museum starts off with the old biplanes and takes you all the way through to modern rockets and missiles out in the yard out behind the museum. So it's, it's a fantastic look at aviation history. Uh, but it's also, it's also, according to a lot of people, full of spirits that come with this aircraft. Uh, there's a theory that some people say that ghosts or spirits can attach themselves to things to inanimate objects, things of value, things of sentimental attachment, or if you think of military, uh, perhaps where, where you know, combat veterans went through some pretty horrific things. Uh, one of the exhibits there is a, a piece of wreckage, a piece of a fuselage from a B-24 bomber called uh, Lady Be Good that went down in the Libyan desert in Africa during World War II. An interesting story about this is, you know, people went out to, to fight the survivors. They found six guys dead in the crash site. Then they found another guy dead. He was 179 miles away from the crash site. He had somehow walked in a Libyan desert after a crash 179 miles. They have no idea how this happened. It's not paranormal. It's just incredible that this happened. And they found his body. But then the interesting thing is they also found, in addition to that, they found a set of footprints that were leading off into the desert. And they tracked them for several miles into the sand, then they just stopped. And, and they, you know, they fan out and everything else looking for them, they, they couldn't find it. You had this one track of footprints just going out into the middle desert, and then what happens to the guy? What, they sprout wings and fly away? They don't know, they never found him. They don't know anything about it. So he's like a missing crewman. The interesting thing here is that in the museum, on the Lady Be Good, all they have is, like I say, just this piece of fuselage, and it's mounted on the wall, and there's a story about these guys in Libya. But there is also a full B-24 bomber intact at the museum, and it's called the, uh, it's called the Strawberry Ditch. And what they say is that you will see crew people from the B-24 actually around this, that people have seen people working on this plane, walking around it. when. There's nothing like that going on. The museum does have, as you see in this picture, and I'll get to this in a second, there are mannequins that are you know, set up as tableaus, but they don't move. They're just silent. With the B-24, there are no mannequins at all. And yet people see these figures walking around the plane. People say that they, which is right, as I say, it's right next to the Lady Be Good wreckage. And people think that it's the crewmen from the Lady Be Good who are sort of thinking, hey, a B-24, this is our B-24. And if you think they're there, it's just kind of interesting. This one I, I like. Um, this, you, it's hard to see it, but this is a railroad boxcar back here. This guy in the foreground is actually wearing a German military uniform. What's happened in this scene is the guys in the train are, you can tell they're airmen. They've got the Air Force jackets and all this. They're, they're captured airmen. They're allied airmen that were shot down. They're on a train that's going to transport, transport them to a German POW camp. You can see the guy in the foreground here, basically, he's just getting ready to go on the train. His buddies are going to help him on. The interesting thing with this picture is that this is, this is an actual train car. This was a real train car that was used by the Germans to transport POWs to camps. And they used to paint right across the roof in huge letters, POW. So as Allied planes were coming over, they would say, protect the, you know, you wouldn't bomb that train. Now, whether, whether it was actually transporting POWs or whether the Germans were being cagey and transporting something else in there, you never knew. But they would do that at the top of the roof. This picture has really, really hard to see. But up here, and a larger one right here, very hard to see in this, in this picture, um, are, are some orbs. Now, orbs are very controversial. And what an orb is, is you take a picture of something, to the naked eye, everything looks fine. I take a picture of this room, I see all you sitting here. <clears throat> then when I run that shot either through a cam, either through a computer, or if it was old film, I had it printed, I would get little sort of globes of light. They call them orbs. Probably 90% of those can be explained away, if not more, by some glitch in the camera, something in the atmosphere, whatever. There's a very small percentage that you really can't understand what they are, or explain them away logically. Some people think that's energy and that it's energy caused spirit energy, that it's a spirit that is there. 
Well, the interesting thing about this picture is I took three pictures in sequence. And the first picture came out with, like I said, these little orbs here. The second picture, which was taken you know, a fraction of a second later, and I, I don't have that one here, but there's like a mist that suddenly appears like right across the center like this. And the third picture, again, a fraction of a second later, is totally clear. No mist, no orbs, no nothing. So within like you know, a second or a second and a half, we went from these little orbs to a mist to nothing. And that's what caught my attention. Not so much just that I had these orbs, but that in the sequence of three pictures, I had two different kinds of anomalies in the photo and then suddenly clear. And this is indoors, you know, under fine conditions. I mean, there wasn't any weather condition that's gonna cause a cloud or vapor or anything else like that. This is a totally dry, climate-controlled area. It's a hangar. So that was kind of surprising to me. Um, there are other aircraft in the museum as well that I could talk about at length, but, but I won't, that people will say they see a pilot, you know, sitting, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a helicopter from Vietnam. People continually see a guy working the controls in it. Of course, there's nobody there. So there's a lot of this kinds of thing. And it makes sense, again, if you think that a spirit could be attached to where it was a horrific event. I mean, a lot of these guys obviously lost their lives in the aircraft, you know, during different wars. By the way, the people at the museum um, were less than forthcoming about, it, about almost anything I asked them. I'd ask the question, and of course I told them I was writing a book and I'm interested about some of the paranormal aspects. And they handed me this form. They said, well, you have to fill out this official request, which went to Washington, D.C. And of course I filled it out in 2003. Haven't heard from them yet. <laughs> <laughs> Things are slow in Washington, I understand. So moving down south a little bit to Cincinnati. This is the Cincinnati Art Museum. And you know, it's interesting, I, I find that places like art museums or, or performance centers, uh, like music halls, which I have one here, uh, that frequently you find theaters, frequently you find hauntings there. And I think the reason for that partly is again because of all the sort of energy that's generated in places like this. We think of the creative energy, the creative process, or for that matter, religious places. I'm, I'm amazed at how many <coughs> ghosts are in churches and temples and places like that, but again, if you think about a bunch of people getting together in prayer or meditation, you think of all that energy, it, it makes sense that some of that might be still hanging around and may in some way be spirit energy. The Cincinnati Art Museum has a couple of different ghosts, and, and I have to say, I'm not sure how authentic some of them are. For instance, the Egyptian mummy that people see walking around, I, I'm not sure about that. The museum does indeed have Egyptian mummies. They have some beautiful sarcophagi and they have some mummies. They've got two or three mummies, I think. Um, security guards have told me that they have seen in that area that they have seen the mummy. So, okay, well, I didn't see the mummy, but they saw the mummy. But there is an interesting one that uh, more people have seen, which is up on the second floor, I think it is, there's a medieval section there's one little room built off, and it's a replica of like a 12th century Spanish chapel. It's a replica. However, what is authentic are the, um, the murals that are inside this chapel. They were actually taken from a Spanish, uh, Spanish chapel in Spain, 12th century, and they were simply put on the walls here. So it's like you're walking into one of these chapels. So although you're, you know, you're walking around actual modern walls, you're surrounded by 12th century tapestries from a chapel, from a religious place. And I have had, I talked to a few different security guards who have told me about seeing a monk, as they describe it, in that area. I talked to one guard who said she was up making the rounds at night, the museum was closed, and she just kind of turned around for whatever reason, and she saw behind her in the archway that was going into this chapel, she said, I saw this black figure. It was like a black hooded figure. She said, I can only think of it as like a monk. And she said, it just stood there. And I said, what did you do? She said, well, I, I just stood there looking at it. And she said, as I watched it, she said it started to rise, and it just lifted up and disappeared through the ceiling. Okay, so I said, what would you do at that point? And she said, well, I took a couple of days off. And, and came back. But it's interesting. There's also a, um, a cover, a tomb cover, of a modern one, of a woman named Lizzie Duvenick. Lizzie Duvenick was married to Ed Duvenick, who was a, a famous artist from Covington, Kentucky, and was one of the art directors at the museum 
around late early 1900s, I guess. Uh, long story short is that Lizzie died in Italy after they were married for only about a year or so. And Lizzie was a burgeoning artist in her own right. Frank Duvenick, I'm sorry, I said Ed, it's Frank Duvenick. Uh, Frank Duvenick, who was a painter, at his wife's death, turned to sculpture. And he made this beautiful cover for her tomb in Florence, Italy. And it's literally Lizzie, full size, lying on her back, head under a pillow, her hair braided, um, you know, hands crossed, so like this beautiful, beautiful statue uh, carving, and a long like palm branch across her body, it's gorgeous. What the museum has, since she was buried in Florence, Italy, and that's where the tomb is, the museum has Frank DeVenick's original plaster cast of that statue, and it's, it's on a big sort of stone pedestal, so it looks like a, like a tombstone. And Again, talking to some of the volunteers there, some of the security people, they'll swear that they have seen Lizzie actually above that, like literally floating above that, that tomb there. Uh, you know, Devenne came back from Italy and became the director of the Cincinnati Art Museum for many, many years. It would kind of make sense that Lizzie wanted to be with them and that she's back at a place that they, you know, they both love. So uh, that's pretty interesting. This is something a little bit modern for the museum, and it's a little bit hard to tell. A friend of mine named Shane Watkins in Cincinnati, who has a paranormal <coughs> investigator, group, was at the museum. And he was in, there's like a, if you haven't been there, it's like an atrium. And you can look up, and it's like a gallery all around. It's in the center of the museum. This was broad daylight. I mean, it was like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And he took a picture. He took a picture looking up. And you can sort of make out something here. It looks something like like a person. Um, when he got that picture, he was surprised because there wasn't anybody standing up there. And he took some other photos, which I don't bother to have up here, but he actually then <coughs> placed himself up there, placed other people up there, and took a picture from the same position down below to see how it would look. And a person standing there really comes out very clearly, very well-defined. You know it's a person. This is odd. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's sort of a human figure, but not quite. And there's nothing else back there. This is, there's no door back there. There's no, there wasn't anything standing there, any kind of a display or anything else like that. There was nothing up there. So uh, he wants to go back and do some more work at the observatory. And I think it's, I mean, it's uh, the uh, art museum. And it's probably worth This is something brand new. The Cincinnati Observatory. Hey, OK, has anybody been down to the Cincinnati Observatory at all? Any astronomers? Have you? You've been there? It's great, it's, it's a beautiful place. Um, a quick little bit of history. In 1845, Cincinnati built the first public astronomy, the, the, per, the first public observatory in the United States. John Quincy Adams laid the cornerstone for the building, and that's how old this is. Uh, they have a telescope in there, it's 163 years old. It's huge, built of mahogany and brass. It's gorgeous, and it still works. I mean, they still use it to look at planets and stars, it's incredible. This building, this is a new location, a new location for the observatory. This building was built in 1873. They moved up from downtown Cincinnati. It was starting to get a little smoky and you know, charcoal burning fireplaces and things like that to a higher location in 1873. And this is the observatory now. In 1943, an astronomer that was in there, um, his son was in World War II serving the Pacific. And as far as you know, he was missing in action. You got a word back that your son is missing. Uh, you haven't found him, we don't know. We're telling you he's missing in action. Uh, at the same time, the astronomer was going through some personal problems of his own, also bad health. So one day, he, uh, <laughs> he went into the main observatory room here where they have this huge telescope. And they have these tall ladders that they use to get up higher to the eyepiece and to adjust things. He went up one of the tall ladders with a rope put the rope around one of the gear mechanisms of the telescope, put the other end around his neck, stepped off the ladder. Um, this was 1943, and the, at first I heard I said, yeah, sure. But then I found that there was an obituary in the New York Times of this guy, and there was a short, short piece in the Cincinnati newspaper in 1943 that said he was a suicide in the observatory. So, very odd. Um, the Shane Watkins, the person <laughs> whose photo you saw in the art museum, and myself, uh, we did an investigation in here one night, uh, and it was, it was pretty incredible. It was in the middle of February, very cold, and you don't heat these buildings because it affects the telescope, so it's cold inside as well. Uh, but we recorded a variety of EVPs, 
um, electronic voice phenomena, which are very interesting. Uh, sound like a human voice, like a male voice. Uh, so we got some of that. We got some um, replies to questions and you know knocking in response to different kinds of things. So it, we, we think there's something there. We'd like to do another full full bore investigation to see what, what else is up there. Uh, this whole thing was triggered by the fact that uh, the observatory historian gives tours there routinely. And in one tour, there was a woman who, when she came out of that observatory area, the dome, said to the guy, his name is John Ventry, she said to him, is there a ghost in this building? He said, what do you, why? What do you, why do you say that? He's like, I sense the presence of something up there. Now, he knew about the suicide, but he never knew anything about a ghost. He never had any experiences, but yet this woman had some sensation of that. So this was last year. Uh, I was on... Um, I was on Coast to Coast AM last year, and John heard the radio broadcast. And so he called me and said, you want to come out and do an investigation? I think I have something here. So that's how that started. And I'm still working with them, because it, it, we'd like to find out what's going on over there. OK. So I said creative places. Cincinnati Music Hall. This place, if you haven't been down there, uh, I suggest you go down there just to see a concert, hear a concert or whatever. It's a beautiful place. It was built in 1873, and it was built on the site of what was the Cincinnati Orphanage. Prior to the Cincinnati Orphanage, it was Cincinnati Hospital, some kind of Cincinnati Hospital and Pest House, which was where they put people who were contagious and usually indigent and you know, derelict or whatever, not people who could pay for good medical care. They put him in there. And there was also a potter's field on that site as well. So you can imagine when you're digging a, a, a foundation for a building like this on a site of what used to be a mental hospital, an orphanage, a pest house, and a potter's field, that you're going to be disturbing some things. I want to read you something, if I can, if you'll indulge me here from... Ghost Hunting Ohio, because this is a great description. I love this. Um, when this was being built, it said that actually the construction began in 1873. In 1876, uh, the journalist Lafcadio Hearn, who's a famous journalist, was writing for the Cincinnati Observer, it was called, the Cincinnati Commercial. And he was observing how the workers were digging up the foundation for this building. And here's his description. He said, this rich yellow soil that with the human flesh and bone and brain it has devoured is being disemboweled by a hundred spades and forced to exhibit its ghastly secrets to the sun. Uh, he says, you will behold mingled with piles of skulls, loose vertebra, fibulas, tibias, and the great curving bones of the thigh. All are yellow like the cannibal clay which denuded them of their fleshly masks. Bone after bone is turned over with a scientific application of kicks. Dirty fingers are poked into empty eye sockets, ribs cracked to reckless feet, and tobacco juice is carelessly squirted among the decaying skulls. And here's my favorite line. By night there come medical students to steal the poor skulls. So this is how human remains were being treated as this place was being built. Now, some of you probably know a theory about sort of disrespecting human remains and kicking skulls around and spitting tobacco juice on, et cetera, et cetera, is not good that you know, spirits kind of resent that sort of treatment, which may, have, which may have something to do with what's going on in Cincinnati Music Hall, which is this. There's a couple things. The obvious thing is people hear music. Well, of course, it's a music hall. But they hear it at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning when there's nobody there. Security guards will tell you that they, it's a big, big complex. There's one main performance area, but there's a lot of other sort of smaller areas for different kinds of sort of smaller recitals. There's meeting areas, so it's a big complex. And I talked to one security guard um, who told me that she frequently has heard music, like coming from one section of the building. And so she'll go over there to see what's going on. And, you know, maybe somebody's there. It could be somebody's practicing at 3 o'clock in the morning. It shouldn't be, but maybe it's possible. And when she goes over there, she won't hear it anymore. Now she'll hear it over there. So she goes over there, and that'll stop. And then she'll hear it over there. Keep tracking it down, and you'll get to the source of it. So that's one thing that happens. 
Uh, another thing that happens is people frequently will see people from around the time of the mid 1800s, 18, 1800, late 1800s as well. Uh, they'll see them in Victorian clothing, like coming down some of the stairs. Frequently when they're performing like an opera or something like that, somebody will be counting the cast members. Let's see, there should be 10 guys in the back. Who's that 11th spear carrier? You know, suddenly there's an extra person in the cast and then he's going. So those kinds of things happen as well. We think, you know, the spirit's coming back to perform, the spirit's coming to watch concerts, you know, we don't know. Very interesting thing happened. There was a security guard named John Eng, and his story is, he actually wrote down the journal, and, I, and he, wrote, he kept a diary of this, and I have a copy of the photocopy of his diary. What happened was, he was working one night, there was a private event being catered up there, and he was escorting the caterers down to their truck, the caterers down to their truck, it was about two o'clock in the morning, they were women, they were loading their stuff onto the truck, as they're going down the elevator, they hear music. Now everybody hears it. John, the security guy, hears it, as well as the, uh, the caterers. That's odd. So he leads them out to the truck. They get in their truck, they take off. He gets back in the elevator. He hears this music again. So he's, he's obviously interested. Like It's 2 o'clock in the morning. There's nobody else in the building. The caterer's gone. I'm here by myself, and I'm hearing music. And he recognizes it. He recognizes the tune as Let Me Call You Sweetheart, you know, that old tune. And he, and he says to me, he didn't say to me, but in his journal, he said that it sounded sort of like, like a music box, kind of, like sort of a teeny kind of sound, an old-fashioned kind of sound. So in his, in his journal, he describes how he rode the elevator up and down, getting off at every floor and, and exploring to try to find the source of this music, and he never could find it. He never could find it. So he said that um, in his journal that for weeks, he wouldn't go near the elevator because he's just afraid of this, this, you know, there's something going on. There's music coming out here and it shouldn't. But then he started thinking that, you know, he started taking it personally, and he started taking it as like a personal sign to him that things go on after death, and look, it's music, and it's let me call you sweetheart. That's not necessarily a bad thing. And he was a guy, it turned out, who had some illness, and a serious illness, so death was sort of on his mind. And just before, let me see, I've got his quote here too, in his journal, so I'll just read that to you. Uh, just before he passed away, his final entry in, in the journal, at least about you know the elevator music, was this. Well, first of all, what he said was about going near. He said, for nearly two weeks, I could not approach the elevator shaft on the first floor late at night without my whole body <coughs> tingling. So then he said, just before his death, the experience now, all positive, and will be forever, I now believe. I pray more intensely, don't fear death, and I'm glad to have had this profound experience. Which is kind of a nice way of looking at a ghost quantum. That, wow, I learned something from it. It was kind of a company thing. So it's kind of an interesting thing. But since that music hall, they, they swear it's still, you know, still haunted. A strange fact, this place is huge. It's in downtown Cincinnati. There are no rats or mice in the building. Now, there used to be rats and mice in the building. There aren't any more. And that sounds like a weird thing because, I mean, come on. It's, it's, it's in downtown Cincinnati. There's rats. I know there's rats. <laughs> You've got to be in this building. Well, the facilities manager had a theory. At one time, there was a circus that performed here. And apparently, a boa constrictor and a python escaped from the circus. Had never been found in Cincinnati Music Hall. There are no rats in Cincinnati <laughs> Music Hall. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Um, the Netherlands and Hilton downtown in Cincinnati is a very interesting place. This was built in the late 20s. A beautiful, beautiful place. It's all art deco. Uh, this, what you're looking at, is called the Hall of Mirrors, and it's one of their main sort of ballrooms. Uh, all, these, all these alcoves are all mirrored glass all around. So if you're standing there, you know, you're seeing a lot of ghosts because every time you turn around, you're seeing somebody. It's just like you, as a matter of fact. Uh, you know, so it's interesting. But they have a ghost they call the Lady in Green. And the hotel, even in its own brochure, talking about their history and their art deco and their architecture, they mention the ghost. They say, oh yeah, by the way, we have a Lady in Green called the ghost. The ghost called Lady in Green. The story behind her is that when this place was being built, her husband was one of the workers that was inside doing some work. And not in this room, but in the restaurant called the Palm Court, 
and the ceilings, it's a two-story high, high building. Uh, apparently he was working on a scaffold or something and fell, was killed. So he died during construction. The story is that when the hotel opened, had its grand opening, that she bought a beautiful green gown, that she went to the hotel, sort of in memory of her husband, that she booked a room in the hotel in memory of her husband, and that she jumped out a window in memory of her husband. Um, that's, that's the story. Nobody knows for sure if that's true. They haven't been able to really authenticate how this happened. But what they do know is that people do see a lady in green frequently. What they usually see is on the elevator. Uh, I talked to a server whose story was this. He got on the elevator with a cart he was taking it upstairs in place. The elevator was empty. The door closes, and as they start to rise, somebody says something. And he turns around, and there's a lady in green standing. Mm. He got off of the brain and stopped as quick as he could. I mean, he said just for a second, then she disappeared. Um, that's happened to other people. They've gotten on a supposedly empty elevator, and somebody taps you on the shoulder, and, you turn, and there's a lady in green. They like to talk about, the staff tells you about a businessman who stayed there one night. <coughs> He came running down to the lobby, apparently in his underwear and socks. I mean, I find this to be a hard story to believe, but that's what I'm told by the people at the hotel. That was so terrified by what he saw in his room, which he could not explain, that he just left. And they put up another hotel. So Lady in Green is apparently still wandering around there. Uh, and I don't know what to make of it, but the hotel is fine about admitting it. Not too far from here, Columbus, this is the Kelton House which was built around 1840, 1850, I believe, something like that. Uh, the last two people who lived there were the Kelton sisters. Uh, Grace Kelton, I think is her name, was actually the last person to live in this house. She died in her 90s, I think in 1980 at some point. Uh, Grace Kelton was uh, a designer, a fashion designer. She actually helped Jacqueline Kennedy when she was in the White House. She actually helped to do some design work in the White House. Uh, so she was very well known, very flamboyant. She, in her 90s, she dyed her hair flaming red. She wore red clothes, red shoes, drove a red Cadillac. So people knew Miss Kelton when they saw her in town. Um, the house is open to the public now. She left it to the city, to the historical society. You can go and you can look at this house, uh, see all the furnishings. And apparently Grace is still there, according to the people that live there. They've had the typical things of objects moving and being misplaced and that kind of thing. Footsteps, doors opening, closing, all the typical ghost stuff. The one thing they had is they have little, uh, a little cradle, a miniature cradle for, for kids to play with. There's two little dolls in there. And the dolls would be put down, you know, lying on their back. And two minutes later, look and the dolls are turned over or they're moved around or the whole, rock, the whole uh, cradle's been turned around different direction. And that'll happen within like five minutes of putting it away. It just seems to do it itself. They have some of these old, uh, they're not big trollers, but they're, um, maybe somebody knows the word for them. They're like huge, huge music boxes. They stand this high. You have like a big metal wheel, and you crank it, and then the wheel just turns around. It's got a little spike, it's like a music box where it hits different things and it plays. It's a phonograph, isn't it? It might be. I don't know, like an old type. Yeah, I guess it may be still phonograph. But it's, it's beautiful sound these things. However, they have one that plays all by itself. Now, you've got this crank is a big iron crank. You've got to crank it. You've got to crank it. You know, and they'll have it up there. And maybe the last time they played it was a day ago. So the handle has been fully released, and it'll just start playing all by itself. So they have that kind of thing going on. They've seen Grace in the house. So yeah, we've seen a lady in red, you know, sitting in her bedroom and everything else like that. So that's an interesting place to, uh, to take a look at as well. One of my favorite places. How am I doing on time here? Anybody? Uh, let's check. Whoa. You guys didn't, oh. you can know when yelled shut up. <laughs> well, too late now. I'm not going to shut up. Well, I'll tell you about this place. We're going to begin. Um, the Ridges in Athens is incredible. Uh, this is now part of Ohio University. I taught at the university for the last several years before I came to Cincinnati. This place used to be the Athens Mental Asylum, and it's now part of the university, which is so appropriate. From I, I, I think of my students, and I say, yeah, it's appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Mental Asylum, University. No problem. Um, most of this building is closed up because of safety. You know, there's asbestos and lead and all that kind of stuff. But the bottom level is, is a museum, uh, art gallery, art museum. So you're going to take a look. People have seen apparitions in here, full-bodied apparitions of patients. Uh, they've heard sounds. A friend of mine was an art instructor. On one of the floors, I think it's this one right here, 
this tower area and part of this floor has been uh, renovated. And fine art instructors have their private studios there so they can work there and they have keys so they can be there 24-7. In the middle of the night, they'll talk about seeing things out of the corner of their eye, something going past the door of their studio. A friend of mine who was an instructor there said he got out of his studio, he was going down the hall to the men's room. He walked into the doorway of the men's room. There's only one door in, and it's a rectangular room, the door is sort of at one end. When you walk in, you're looking at a bank of mirrors over the sinks. So obviously, as soon as you look in at the mirrors, you can see anybody else that's in that room. So as he gets in the doorway, he notices there's a man reflected in the mirror. And it's not him, the guy's wearing a jacket, he has a hat. So he's, he's a little nervous because he thought he was in the place by himself, but he's also not thinking anything unusual. Okay, so there's a guy here. I don't know who it is, but big deal. He walks in, there's nobody there. I mean, there is no other person in that room, and he is standing in the only doorway in and out. So somehow this guy disappeared. Uh, I did an investigation here with a group out of Columbus, and we recorded some really interesting EVPs in the basement. The basement is where uh, they used to lock up the patients that were really sort of hardcore, in danger of hurting themselves or others. And so it was like a prison for the most part for those patients. And we got some EVPs. One very clearly says, help me please, coming out of there. So interesting. There's another nice little thing about this place that is not so much paranormal. You can't see it too well. I guess you can. Um, in its heyday, there was about 1,500 to 1,800 patients here. Um, 1873 is when it was built, so it was very popular in those days. But right up into the 1980s, there were still patients. A small group of maybe a dozen hardcore patients that couldn't yet be put out into the community, no place to put them, so they stayed there until they you know, passed away. They used to take a census every day, morning and evening, I think midday, to make sure everybody is still here. Well, one day in the 80s, they took a census, and a particular woman was missing, was gone. They couldn't find her. They looked all over the floor for her, looked all over the hospital, they couldn't find her. Long story short, about three months later, if you recall those towers that you saw before in that uh, picture, they found her lying in one of these tower rooms on her back, arms crossed like this, her clothes are all neatly folded alongside of her, like she'd just taken off her clothes, decided that's it, and laying down and die. Um, she basically died as near as they can figure of exposure and possibly a heart attack. But the interesting thing is, when they picked up her body, her image was left on the floor. And you can clearly, I mean, you can clearly see it. I think head, shoulders, the elbows were waist, skirt, the whole bit, legs. Um, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why this may have happened. She was lying there for a few months in a room that had a lot of sunlight, a lot of windows. Uh, we tend to turn to goo at some point. I think that's what was happening. That's the medical term, by the way. <laughs> and uh, I think that's what you know, basically happened to her. But the interesting thing is, that was in the 1980s. This is my picture taken in 2003. Mm. The image is still there. And the legend, of course, is that it can never be erased. Well, I don't think anybody's actually tried. There's no point. It's a locked floor. It's an abandoned war. But it's just kind of a uh, neat little story. The other thing, too, is my students used to tell me, they said, you know, Mr. Kuchuba, if you, if you touch that image up there, if you get up there and you touch that image, you're going to die. I said, you know what? You're going to die anyway. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to skip to this. This is not that important. I mean, I want to get to just the end because I know those of you are coming on. I just want to say that there's a couple things going on. Um, the first book was Ghost Hunting Ohio for me and Ghost Hunting Illinois, but I'm also serving as an editor for Clarice Press, who is doing a series of books called America's Haunted Road Trip. And each one is about a different state. So we already have New Jersey and Virginia in the lineup. Uh, this fall we'll have Maryland, Texas, uh, Pennsylvania. So if you have a favorite state, you know, next year we're doing New York City, uh, Florida, Southern California, all different writers, not me. We're getting some top writers to write these books. And then that's my own website too, if you're interested in anything that I'm doing. So I, I do want to just take a few minutes for questions. I know we have somebody coming on at 11.30 and I apologize for that, but are there any questions or comments or anybody want to throw anything? Yes. Are you going to be doing Michigan soon? We, well, I have a lineup now for next year and for 2011. But Michigan is a state we want to do very soon, so I'm thinking maybe 2012, which in the publishing world is very soon. It's only three years away. <laughs> you know. Michigan, Wisconsin, probably those areas, because it's a big population. So. Any questions? Yes? We were just skipping Collingwood Art Center. Can yes. you tell us a little bit about that? All right, I will. Just, just briefly. Collingwood Art Center. Um, 
I'm gonna go back to it. Is a, uh, it, it used, it's up in Toledo, and it used to be um, a Catholic school run by Ursuline nuns. It is now an art center where artists actually live there, and all kinds of artists, performing artists, you know, sculptures, visual, whatever. They live here and they perform their art. Um, a friend of mine told me that, they, that she had some impressions. She was a medium and she had some impressions that there was something going on there. So I went to check it out. And without saying anything, I just told the director that I was writing a book and I heard something about this and he said, okay, I just want, I told him I just want to look around. He said, fine, do that. I went down to the basement area, which is a urinal halls and, and different kinds of rooms. This was a pretty big complex. And as I was walking down there through a dark passage, um, the air just sort of suddenly in one passage as I'm walking kind of got, for lack of a better word, thick. It felt heavy all of a sudden, like dense. It's kind of strange. And it, it suddenly got very quiet, too, as if I was walking into something. And at the same time, I also got like this immediate sense of um, not anxiety, but sort of sadness, like depression. And some of you know me, those of you that don't, I'm not a depressive kind of guy, trust me. So I kept walking, like another five feet, and then boom, everything was gone. All that just lifted. I was still in the dark, still by myself, but all those feelings were gone, that heaviness was gone. So I basically just stopped and said, what was that? Um, I went back upstairs, I was talking to some of the artists that were there, and they proceeded to tell me that they have something in the basement called Shadow Man. And they said, a couple artists have had the thing where Shadow Man has literally been on the stairs and come right up, literally blown through them, as they say. They describe Shadow Man as a black silhouette, featureless silhouette. Um, so I asked one of the artists, where do you experience that in the basement? And we went back down in the basement, and you'll probably guess what I'm going to say. One of the areas they saw it a lot was where I had this experience. Now, did I see Shadow Man? No. But I certainly felt something. Uh, the story is that after I left, about two weeks after I left, the art director at the place called me and said, you know, we had some visitors. And he said some elderly women came and uh, they said that they were retired nuns, Ursuline nuns, who used to teach at this place and went to school. And they wanted to take a tour because he had heard about how the place had revitalized itself and, you know, they're happy to see that. So he said, yeah, I gave them a little tour, I showed them all around. He said, as I was leading them out, as they were saying goodbye, one of them turned around to me and she said, by the way, she said, is the shadow still in the basement? <laughs> and he said, I hadn't said anything. And there was nothing in the newspapers or anything else. As far as I know, I'm the first person to have written about it. Um, so he said, that really surprised. And he said, well, people have seen something. And they explained what it was. They said that one of their fellow nuns, uh, a young nun, very early, had actually committed suicide in the basement, that she hanged herself. And uh, they said, you know, we know who it is. When, when we were there, she was still there in spirit. We knew who she was, but we still were very afraid to go down there and, you know, be open. So, so that's the, and Collingwood, it's still, there's a lot of other things that happen there too. People experience doors opening, closing, objects moving, all that kind of stuff, but, yeah. Okay, yes. Uh, do you have any plans on building uh, military ships or, or in the future? Um, we've got a couple in some of the other books, like there's one about Maryland, and they have, I think, the Constellation that's in Baltimore Harbor. Uh, somebody that's doing a book about Texas has a ship, I don't know if it's the Galveston or something like that, but uh, if I would not do a book just about ships. But certainly, I'm going to be doing another Ohio you know, book. So if there was a ship somewhere up in Lake Erie or something, a historic ship, yeah, definitely. In my Chicago book, uh, my Illinois book, rather, I wrote about um, the Chicago Museum of Natural Science or Science and Industry has a captured German U-boat from World War II. And the captain actually committed suicide in that boat, shot himself during a bombardment. Um, so I wrote about that. So yeah, and I certainly do if I see the opportunity. Definitely. Do you have something in mind? Well, uh, we we were on the way to Lex, and my wife experienced a very hard feeling on it. She said it felt like a freezer. Somebody opened up a freezer in the middle of the lake. Oh, really? Lex. And considering it's not air conditioned, that would be, uh, and it's not about 90 degrees, you know. Yeah. Well, there's certainly a lot of haunted ships, yeah. I mean, if they're, if they're within one of the states that we're doing, we'll take a look at it. All right, any other questions? Or? Yes. I was wondering if you've ever been up to Power House in Akron. Power House, yeah. 
uh, Howard House was a, uh, uh, it's a big mansion that's now part of the University of Akron's campus. Okay. And uh, my brother-in-law told me a story. He was a maintenance man for the university. And uh, the Howards were a, a very influential family in Akron for a lot of years. And uh, the last occupant was, was the woman. I don't know what her name was. But uh, he and uh, an associate were called in to do some work on the water heater that was in the house. The house was totally locked up. It was filled with antiques, so it was completely locked up so no one could get in. They were issued a key, uh, told to unlock the door, go in, lock the door behind them, all that. So they're down in the basement working on the water heater, and a woman's voice very clearly that they could hear kept asking them, hello, hello, yeah. hello. And finally, you know, my, my brother-in-law, is he's a very cool guy. I mean, he's a Vietnam vet. He very calmly says, hi, we're the maintenance people. We're here to fix your water heater. And after that, <laughs> the voice stopped saying hello. But uh, <clears throat> they were called back later that afternoon uh, because the water had been turned on in the bathtub. Uh. And it had been turned on to perfect bath temperature. Two, uh, <laughs> two faucets had been turned on. And uh, no one had been in the house. But uh, <laughs> apparently, uh, Mrs. Howard is still there. So, I'm taking a bath. <laughs> Why do you say hello? Uh, I'm taking a bath here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if that's. I, I would assume that the university probably doesn't open that up to the public. But that's yeah. a really interesting place. They might. I don't know. I mean, it's. I, I try to write about things that the public can go to, you know, to encourage them to do that. And there are some places that, yeah, you can't do. But I, I don't know. I didn't know about that. I will check into it. All right, well, I know we have somebody coming up soon, so I'm going to have to cut it here. I do have a booth out here, so if you have other questions or just want to come by and talk, certainly feel free to me, but I think we have to conclude now. So I appreciate your patience and your, uh, your diligence so early in the morning for the first go-around. So thanks very much. Thank you.